together. <laughs> Our study is in the little book of 1 John, which is uh, over near the back of your Bible, right after 1 and 2 Peter. And we pointed out that this is one of three writings by this same writer. He wrote the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel. He wrote the Revelation, the last book in the Bible. And he wrote these three little epistles called 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He pointed out that one of the unique things about the writings of John is the fact that he always tells us why he writes. For instance, in uh, the Gospel of John, he said, uh, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And he goes on to explain just what God means about li by life, and this is eternal life that transcends death. So the Gospel of John was written that uh, we might know how to come into possession of eternal life. Then the epistles of John uh, were written, as we're told in 1 John 5, 13, uh, where he says, These things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye might know that you have eternal life. That is to say, uh, those who have already come into possession of uh, eternal life need a steadfast assurance. And so this little book was written, among other things, that... Uh, uh, one who has already received the life might have the confidence and the assurance that he is in current possession. We pointed out last uh, week that there really is no such thing as life after death. But there is something infinitely better than that, and that is life through death. God wants to give us a life that will go into death and out the other side. And if we do not come into possession of this uh, greatest of all possessions, so that the Apostle Paul said, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And he points out that this is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what, uh, we're, what we need to do is to come into possession of this eternal life between now and the grave, because that's too late. We must acquire eternal life on this side of the grave. It's not something that can be uh, obtained uh, on the other side. So, since this is true, then it's most important, isn't it, to know for sure whether or not you're in possession. And this is why this little book was written, so that we might have this assurance. Then we pointed out last time that the Revelation uh, was written uh, so that we might uh, know the things that are going to come to pass in the future. We've uh, pointed out also that the Gospel of John is the revelation of the past ministry of Christ. Or that is to say, it tells us what God wants us to know about what Jesus Christ did in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection when he was here on earth. The epistles of John explain to us or reveal to us what Jesus Christ is doing today in and through people uh, who have come to him for salvation or for eternal life. So we might say the gospel of John reveals that which he did for us historically. The epistles reveal what he is willing to do in us and through us presently. And the book of Revelation tells us what he plans to do uh, with us in the future. We might also say that uh, the Gospel of John is uh, divine life or eternal life revealed in Christ. And the epistles are the divine life, divine eternal life realized in the Christian. So uh, this has to do uh, with now. This is a now book. It's for us today as we walk through this life. And we have in this little short chapter, first chapter, with only ten verses, we have listed for us five Christian privileges that are enjoyed by no one else on earth. 
no bo- no Buddhist, no Muslim, no uh, unconverted Jew, no heathen, or no nominal Christian or just church member can claim any of these five privileges. They're only for those who have been born into the family of God. God says in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12, as many as receive him, that is Jesus Christ, to as many as received him, to them, he gives the power to become the sons or the children of God. And so uh, if we are the children of God, we have certain privileges, privileges. Five of those, and there are many, are enumerated for us here in this first chapter of 1 John. So let's go ahead now and read uh, verses 1 and 2, and we'll talk about the first of these five uh, Christian privileges. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Now you see, eternal life has always been. It's been in heaven with the Father. And Jesus Christ brought it with him. That life was in Christ. We pointed out last week, that everything in this world is on its way to death from the very moment it uh, obtains that which we call life. Every little baby that's born, every little bird that's hatched, every little plant that sprouts is on its way to its death the very moment it has life. And so you see, this is a death world. There is no life here in this world. Life was brought into this world from outside of this world where life was and is and always will be. Life was brought into the world. And what John is saying here, he says, I know this is true. He says, I saw this life. I handled it in the person of Jesus Christ. It was made manifest. So our first Christian privilege is a certain knowledge. Nobody else has this knowledge. Remember, we pointed out in 1 John 5, 13, he said, he wrote this that you may know that you have eternal life. And we'll get into this a little further when we get into the first, fifth chapter. But in that chapter, we're told how God causes us to have this certain knowledge. We'll just give you a little preview. But there, in that fifth chapter, it is said that he places the knowledge down within us. And when he does that, The knowledge is stronger than any knowledge that we can receive from human sources. Now, I'll try to give you a little example, and we'll be doing this again when we get to the fifth chapter. When I went to school, and I was in the first grade, uh, the holidays came along, and pretty soon we came to a day that was called George Washington's birthday. And, uh, you know, we uh, made little hatchets out of the uh, uh, paper, And uh, we uh, heard how he could not tell a lie and all of that. And we heard the story of George Washington. And we were told that he grew up to be the first president and the father of our country. Now, I never met George Washington. But I believed with all my heart that there was such a man. And I believed that he was truly the first president of the United States. And I still believe that 40-some years later. I haven't changed my mind. Now, I received all of that knowledge through human sources. That is to say, I trusted the people that related that to me. I I didn't detect that they were trying to fool me and just build up some sort of an image of a fictitious human being that never really was, just to make me more patriotic. I never had any doubts about that. I'm very confident that the first president of this country was a man named George Washington. And... uh, Uh, I don't believe you could convince me elsewise. I I believe that that you could just uh, bring all kind of information. And I'd never believe otherwise. I have a firm knowledge. I'm satisfied with that knowledge. And I don't have any doubts about it. But I learned it from human sources. I placed my trust in the source. Well, God says that he can give you a knowledge that's firmer that's surer 
than any knowledge of any kind that you receive from human sources. And he says that's why he wrote this book. Isn't it a pity that we don't spend more time so that we might have that type of knowledge? So a Christian can have certain knowledge. And this is what John is saying in these first two verses. He says, look, he says, we were right there. We saw this life manifested. There's no doubt in our minds. We're relating something that's a positive truth. He said, we've received it. And he says, we want to deliver it unto you. Do you know when he was talking about, in this, in this first verse, he's speaking, he has particular reference in these first two verses to the time that he saw the glory of, of Jesus transformed on the Mount of Transfiguration. You've read that in the Gospels, haven't you? How he went up to the top of this mountain. He took three people with him, didn't he? He took Peter, James, and John. And up there on that top of that mountain, they saw Christ transformed into a heavenly being so that his whole being glowed. And he was showing, he had told them he was going to show them. He was going to manifest what the future would be like. And they saw him. And they saw Isaac and Moses. I mean, they saw Isaiah. I'll get it right yet. Anybody know? <laughs> they saw Elijah and Moses there, didn't they? Now, Peter had something to say about this. Hold your place in 1 John and go back just one book because the book just before 1 John is 2 Peter. And in the first verse of 2 Peter, in the first chapter of 2 Peter, Peter has much to say about knowledge. As a matter of fact, in the first uh, few verses, in the first eight verses, you can find the word knowledge about five times uh, in the first uh, eight verses of the uh, first chapter of Second Peter. Now, we want to read, beginning with uh, verse 16 of Second Peter chapter 1, and you're going to see that Peter had a certain knowledge. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now he's going to explain what he means by that. For, we, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now remember when they were up on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, the they, heavens opened up. And God uh, said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Verse 18, and this voice which came from heaven, we heard and we were with him in the holy mount. He says, we're not telling you stuff we made up. We were right there. We know what we're talking about. And you see, Peter was there and John was there. And they're relating this to you. So he says, you can have a certain knowledge. Now, let me warn you this. You will never have an absolute, positive, unshakable, certain knowledge just because John and Peter testify about it. Now, they had a certain knowledge, and they want you to have a certain knowledge. But God has a different method, or he has a, 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 a more profound method of getting certain knowledge down inside of your being. You know how he does it? by interesting you in reading this Bible. See, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you read enough in this Bible, the time will come, that is, if you read while the Holy Spirit opens up your understanding, the time will come when you will know beyond any refutation whatsoever that these things are true. God will place the knowledge within you and you'll never have a doubt. You cannot have a doubt because God will give you the absolute assurance. And this is what this book is all about. A Christian can have a certain knowledge. Now, if you were to do this, I've done it, so I'll assure you. If you were to ask a question to most of the people who go to church on Sunday, in the largest churches in, in Sebring, for instance, if you were to accost them after, as they came out of that church and you were to ask them if they were Christians, most of them would say, I, I, yes, I am. Uh, well, they'd probably say, well, I'm, I'm a Baptist or I'm a Methodist or I'm a, a Catholic. But uh, uh, with that little addition, they'd say, yes, they're a Christian. 
And then if you said this, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? You know what they, most of those people would say? Well, I certainly hope so. Well, I certainly hope so. Or they might even say, well, only God knows. But I'm working then in that direction. Now, if you ask very many people, those are the type of phrases you'll get. Well, I, I think I'm heading that way. No certain knowledge. You see, no other religion gives a certain knowledge. They don't even claim to give a certain knowledge. All uh, uh, Mohammedism, for instance, holds out is if you do certain things, if you follow certain procedures, then you have a better chance than if you don't follow. Or to the extent you can involve yourself in these ways, you can have some sort of a hope. Or even in in uh, much that calls itself Christianity. It says, if you follow the instructions of the church well enough, you can at least hope to end up in the place uh, where you'll have a chance to eventually get to heaven. Uh, if, if, you, if you do certain things, but no certain knowledge, uh, no teaching that, yes, without a shadow of a doubt, regardless of whatever happens from here on in, there's one thing I'm sure of, I'll be in glory with the Lord. A certain knowledge. Now, this is a pitiful thing. There are many saved people who come to God God's way. How, how do you get saved? You get saved by saying, God, I agree with you that I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. I believe you've loved, you love me and that you've provided a way to yourself and I want to come to you your way. That's how you get saved. By wanting within your heart to come to God his way. His way is by Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary's cross. But that's how you get saved. Now there are a lot of people that have done that and yet they have no real assurance. They don't have a certain knowledge. John had a certain knowledge. Peter had a certain knowledge. They both want you to have a certain knowledge. God wants you to have a certain knowledge. But most Christians walk around this earth with never having that certain knowledge. That's the reason they're so fruitless as witnesses. How can you convince somebody of something until you have the certain knowledge? But it's a Christian privilege. And if you don't have that knowledge, you're not enjoying a privilege that you have. And nobody else has the privilege. And the privilege is for this life. You see... In the next life, you won't need the certain knowledge. It'll be manifested. You'll be right there in it. So this certain knowledge of which we speak is for this life. And how pitiful that so few Christians have appropriated for themselves this which God wants to bestow upon us. A certain knowledge. You're most privileged because if you're a child of God, you're the only group of people in the whole world that are privileged to have a certain knowledge. Now, in verse 3, we have the second of these Christian privileges. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The next uh, Christian privilege is fellowship with God. Now, there are certain other religions that give sort of an awe, uh, of God or a, a sort of a fear uh, of God but no fellowship you see fellowship is when you meet on equal terms you say you mean we can meet on equal terms with God well as far as our concourse with him we can only because Christ has made us one with God and we're going to get into this more in the second chapter. It's because we have a mediator, an advocate with the Father, one who is truly human. One is human right along with us, and yet he's also God. And so we can fellowship with God. But fellowship with God is only in and through Jesus Christ. And if I'm not one with him, I have no fellowship with God. There's um, one of the... Christian men up in Lakeland that's been carrying on a correspondence with a, with a man 
who says he's an agnostic, and he's written quite a dissertation, you know, just on what an agnostic is. Well, you know, that's just the opposite of a certain knowledge. It comes from two Greek words, meaning uh, don't know. No knowledge is what it really means. It uh, it's, uh, comes from the word uh, gnosis, which is knowledge, and ah, which is the negative. It puts the word knowledge in negative. So it's negative. Uh, you cannot have knowledge. And agnostic says... Uh, nobody can know whether there's a God or not. An atheist says there is no God. See, it's the same thing. Uh, theist means one who believes in a God. An atheist or an atheist is one who does not believe in God. One who says there is no God. An agnostic says nobody can know whether there's a God or not. And the strange thing about it is you read, he was reading some of the letters that this man wrote and some of his espousing his ideas. And he's really proud of the fact that uh, uh, that he doesn't know. And he, and he says, well, well, here's the sort of the thought, you see. I'm pretty smart, and I don't know, therefore nobody knows. It is a rather prideful type of belief, you know. Just because I don't believe, or, or I don't know, then obviously nobody knows. And he goes into how he's uh, looked for God. He says, I look for God in Buddhism, and I look for God in Taoism, and I look for God in Confucianism, and I looked in God for God in uh, uh, Mohammedism, and I look for God in Christianity, and I look for God here and there. And he says, I've looked for God everywhere. And I made a careful study and a complete search, and I didn't find God, so there is no God. There's no, only one thing. He didn't come to God through the person of Jesus Christ, you see. And so he says, uh, I'm a smart man, I've looked, and I don't know, so nobody can know. He doesn't only have a, uh, he doesn't lack a certain knowledge. He, de he says nobody else can have this certain knowledge. And he has no fellowship with God because he, as an agnostic says, God cannot be fellowshiped with if there's a God. He says, I don't deny there's a, uh, whether there's a God or not. I just say that if there's a God, he's not knowable or else I'd know him. So, uh, Nothing but true Christianity can get fellowship with God the Father. We can have fellowship with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. Now in verse 4. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Now, fullness of joy is the desire of Jesus Christ and the desire of God for you. And we need to know what joy is. It's not the same as uh, what we generally construe as happiness. Now, the word happy and happiness is in the Bible, uh, but it doesn't have quite the same connotation that we use. Uh, when we talk about being happy, we're talking about uh, we want good circumstances. See, happiness depends upon happenings. And if you were to ask the average uh, high school student, What's the most important thing in the world? And they'd say to find a, a life filled with happiness. What they're really saying is, is to have a life in which the circumstances are pleasant. That's the, that's the goal. And like if you get married and the circumstances are not pleasant with that one, try another one because happiness is what is most important. And, you know, I was reading in one of these... Uh, or somebody uh, gave me this article about one of these uh, ladies that write to the love lorn, that type of deal. And they said, you know, you used to always advise people to save the marriage at any cost. It says, now you don't do that anymore. Why? And she says, I came to the conclusion that happiness is more important than marriage. And you see, that's a philosophy that we have, that everybody has a right to look for happiness. Well, God has something better than happiness. He has something he calls joy. And there's a difference. I'll try to explain this to you. Suppose you were to go to a football game and you have these little uh, cheerleaders down in front there, you know, trying to uh, get everybody to cheer. And let's suppose the game's been sort of so-so. And here it is about uh, 30 seconds before the end of the first half, and our team 
is right down on the one yard line of the other team. Now, when that team goes over that goal line just as the gun sounds off, you look at those cheerleaders and you'll see an expression of sheer happiness. They'll be hugging one another. Their, their uh, whole uh, selves will be caught up into rhapsody. They'll be beside themselves with happiness. And uh, carrying on, smiling, and, and just everything, slapping e each other on the back, and just, uh, you know, because they've been uh, so tense, and now they're relieved because they're, they're ahead. All right? They didn't make the extra point, by the way. <laughs> now, the second half comes along. And uh, got the same sort of a just an old blah seesaw deal, and it's still six to nothing, you see. Now, it's 30 seconds before the end of the game, and the other team is on our one-yard line. And just before the gun goes off, they score six points. Now, you look at those same cheerleaders. Will they be the same expression? Uh, the, uh, the same uh, general sa uh, set of circumstances happened, didn't they? Uh, in, in most of the essential parts. But you look upon their faces and there's a terrible change come about. Because, you see, the circumstances didn't suit uh, their emotions. And so, because of something that happened, their happiness left. By the way, the other team made the extra point. So how are they going to go home? I remember one time when I was in high school... We were a little tiny town up in North Florida. And uh, we used to pick one or two big towns. Usually, you know, we, we played little old towns like Jasper and Madison and uh, somebody's laughing, Lake City and that type of deal. If we wanted to really eat high on the hog, we'd go down and play Ocala. But once a year, we always played Tallahassee. There was only one high school in Tallahassee, Leon High School. And every year, they would slaughter us. <laughs> I mean, just slaughter us. Well, one, uh, well, two years running, we got a, an extra good team. And so one year, they only beat us seven to six. Why? They had a big dance and a big party after the game, and everybody was happy. They were happy because they won, and, and we were happy because we came so close, you know. And we'd never, uh, never beat them before. Well, the next year, our team won 26 to nothing. And they were so humiliated and so mortified that not one single one of them showed up at the after-game party. They all put their tails behind between their legs and headed back for Tallahassee, 90-some miles away. And uh, there was no party because, uh, you see, <laughs> there was no happiness. So you see, the circumstances, happenings, take away happiness. Now, God has something for the Christian that circumstances cannot in any way alter. It's the same general type of an emotion. But it's entirely unaffected by circumstances. Now let's see some examples of this. Uh, let's look in the book of uh, Acts, chapter 5. Acts 5.41 Well, let's start with verse 40. Acts 5.40 And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and let them go. And they, that is the apostles, departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing, that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, and daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Now, what had happened to these fellows? They were all enthused about something. And uh, the authority says, you can't do that anymore. And says, if you do, we'll put you in jail and beat you and all that. And they did it anyhow. But where uh, the circumstances went terribly sour. But did they lose their happiness? Well, you see, they had something better than happiness. 
It didn't depend upon happenings. They had joy. Uh, let's look. Uh, let's see. In in First Thessalonians, if we can find that. Said, uh, let's see. In First Thessalonians, verse one, uh, uh, chapter one, verse six, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction and with joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, those two phrases don't seem to go together. Much affliction and joy at the same time. Well, we have all types of examples of that. Remember when Paul and Silas uh, were beaten and put in the deep, dark dungeon of the jail and put in stocks, and they just started singing up a storm because their hearts were so filled with joy they couldn't contain themselves. Their circumstances were terrible, weren't they? If you want a, a, a real profound uh, experience along these lines, read the book of Philippians, always understanding that when Paul wrote that, he was in prison and he was waiting for his execution. And the whole book is, is uh, filled with joy, rejoicing, and that type of phraseology. So you see, joy cannot be hindered by circumstances. Why can't it? Well, Jesus lets us know this. Uh, are we, we're, we're told about this in the book of Revelations concerning, and the book of Hebrews concerning Jesus, where the writer says in Hebrews chapter 12, he says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the suffering and the shame, even to death on the cross. You see, a Christian is not looking at the circumstances. He's got his eyes so focused on the promises of God about things in the future that he can't be bothered worrying about little eventualities that are happening now. Because God has given him a positive assurance. He wants your joy to be full. Remember when Jesus was with his disciples that last evening, uh, that uh, scene that we call the upper room, upper room scene. It's described particularly in chapters 14, 15, and 16 of uh, the book of John. And uh, he had just told them he was going to be crucified and they were very sad. And he said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Well, if you read that 14th chapter and the 15th and 16th chapter again and again he brings up this matter of joy I want you to have fullness of joy hitherto have you asked nothing in my name ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full you see a Christian has the privilege of fullness of joy if that's true why are there so many sad Christians and there are a lot of them I'll tell you they come to my office and they moan about everything Christians have more troubles, it seems like, than anybody in the world. And their troubles just defeat them something awfully. And yet God says we're supposed to have whatever the circumstances, we can appropriate fullness of joy. And we're told in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that this is fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit gives us this joy. Someone has said, joy is peace that bubbles. Joy is effervescent peace. Now, it's easy for us to understand, have complete peace and tranquility of heart. Well, when that, uh, that uh, peace uh, gets so enjoyable, it has to sort of, you know, bubble out like a fountain. And joy is that wonderful quietness and rest of soul that just flows out and you can't contain it. Like those apostles back in Acts chapter 5. Their joy was just bubbling out, wasn't it? So this is a privilege. And it's for now. And it's only to be appropriated. And John says that you can acquire this uh, through this book. He says that's why he wrote it. See, verse 4. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Somebody said God, uh, John gives four reasons for writing the book of 1st John he gave one reason for writing the gospel of John and one reason for writing the revelation he gives four reasons for writing this little epistle some other people are able to find seven reasons why he wrote it uh, and here's 
See, one of them would be in verse 3, that we may have fellowship with the Father. And one another in verse 4, that your joy might be full. Right on to verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now, he says that we can walk in light instead of walking in darkness. The Bible calls unsaved, pilgrim, uh, unsaved people the children of the night, the children of darkness. And, he ca and it calls saved people the children of the day. We're not children of the night. We're children of the day. We look forward to the bright day that's coming. One of the most horrible ways in which hell is described is everlasting darkness, the blackness of darkness. Now you say, how can it be a lake of fire and also be dark? Well, the, the Bible says it's both of those things. Now, I don't know just what constitutes fire as far as the soul, the eternal soul is concerned. And I don't know how the eternal flames of damnation compare with the physical flames uh, uh, that uh, would sear uh, this earthly flesh. But I know it's at least as bad, or God wouldn't call it... Uh, it must be somewhat different chemically if we were going to analyze it. But it would have uh, the direst of effects. And if it's so bad that God can only explain it by flames of fire, I don't want to go there. But also hell is called blackness of darkness. Now I'll show you a couple of places. We could go back again to our book of Second Peter. And he's talking here of... Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, he's speaking concerning false prophets and he's calling them several names and he says in 2 Peter 2, 17, these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. And he's talking about the punishment of the falling angels back in the same chapter, verse 4, for if God spared not the angels that sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness reserved unto judgment. And then uh, over on the other side of 1 John, we have the little book of Jude. Uh, that's also uh, a book concerning false prophets. And it says some of the same things. Look at verse 13 in Jude. Now Jude's next to Revelation. It, he's speaking about false prophets. It says they're waging, wa raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. The Bible tells about a time when there were flames of fire and thick darkness when Moses went up to the top of the mount and the people thought he'd been consumed by it. Uh, maybe we ought to turn there. It uh, might run you through a little chase, but uh, perhaps it would be a good thing for us to do so that you can see the two can be in conjunction one with the other. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible. And in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5. Verse 22. These words of the Lord spoke, these words the Lord spoke unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire of the cloud and of the thick darkness with a great voice and he added no more and he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. See, they were, these was a message of judgment. And it came to pass when ye heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness for the mountain did burn with fire. So at least one place here you got fire and great darkness together, haven't you? Well, it might be. But uh, I'm only bringing out the point that we're talking about a fire and black and darkness together. Now, if there's, if there's two things that are true, they're these. That hell is a place of fire, and hell is also a place of the absence of all light. You see, light is from God. God is light. And hell is the, uh, is the absence of everything godly. There'll be no love there. 
There'll be no hope there. There'll be no faith there. There'll be no joy there. There'll be no light there. Just black darkness. You, sometimes you hear people say, well, I guess I'll go to hell. That's where all my friends are going to go. Well, they, they think in terms of having fellowship. Well, there's no fellowship in hell. It's just one individual in his own torments to himself. You don't have any fellowship. You don't have any friends in hell. And if you did accost another person, he'd be fuming and, and cursing God so much till uh, he wouldn't have any time to, to uh, fellowship with you. It, it's not going to be a pretty picture. Uh, there's three times in the Bible when God gives us a little preview of how black Black is when there's a complete absence of light. There's one time back during the plagues in uh, the book of Exodus where God says that darkness came upon the land for uh, a period of time, for three days and three nights, and it was so dark that, that people were so oppressed that they couldn't get up out of their beds, that the darkness oppressed them. And then for three hours when Christ hung on the cross, we're told that the sun went out and for three hours in midday it was absolutely black. And then there's a place over in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, that's going to happen during the time of the tribulation when God's going to obliterate all light and the darkness will be so oppressive that the Bible says people will gnaw their tongues in anguish. Now that's kind of bad. But we ought to get the point that we should flee from something that horrible and flee into the one who says, I am the light of the world. Because where Christ is, if you're where Christ is, you don't ever have to worry about the dark because he is light. He says, there be no need for a sun there because uh, he's the, the light. He shall light the place. And he lights our path now and we have the privilege of walking in the light. And yet here again, many Christians walk in the darkness. Back in 1 John, you'll notice this term walk. It's used very frequently in the Bible, and it, and it speaks of that time between the day you were saved and the day that you'll go to meet God, either through the grave or through the rapture. That's your walk on earth. And God says that walk can be in the light. Notice again verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, see, if we're walking, abiding in him, we're walking in the light. We have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we have the privilege of walking in the light. That's Christian privilege number four. Number one was a certain knowledge. Number two was fellowship with God. Number three was fullness of joy. Number four is walking in the light. And now we come to number five, and we're going to read again verse seven. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. Now, in verse 6, if we say uh, this, we're fooling ourselves, uh, we're uh, fooling, trying to fool others. We're dishonest with those around us. If we say, uh, I have fellowship, but if we're walking in the darkness, we're not walking in the light, walking in the presence of the Lord, then we're just fooling someone else. In uh, verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we're fooling ourselves. And in verse 10, if we say we've not sinned, we're trying to fool God. So if we say, if we say, if we say, uh, and we have these propensities, sometimes what we say, we say trying to uh, get others to believe certain things about us. And sometimes we say things to, to try to build, build, bolster up our own uh, beliefs. We're fooling ourselves. Sometimes when we say, we're fooling others. Sometimes when we say, we're fooling ourselves. And sometimes when we say... We're attempting to fool God. Now he says you can be clean two different ways. In verse 7 he said, if we walk in the light, 
the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And in verse 9 it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now what does it mean the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin? Well, this matter of the significance of the blood of Christ is of considerable concern to many Christians. And we're going to get into this when we get to the fifth chapter. Uh, there's a verse over there that says there are three that witness on earth. The water and the blood and, what's the, and the spirit. And we're going to get into that matter of witness. But right now, so that we might have at least some uh, idea that the blood of Christ is significant, let me read you a list of descriptive terminology that's used in the Bible concerning the blood. I've, I've, I've listed these in the flyleaf of my Bible. And I could give you these scripture references, but I won't uh, point them out. I'll just start with two or three. He says we're purchased by the blood of Christ in Acts 20, 28. We're, we have remission of sin by the blood, Romans 3, 24 and 26. We're justified by the blood. We have communion with God by the blood or in communion with one another by the blood. We are redeemed by the blood. We have peace through the blood. We're sanctified by the blood. We have perfection by the blood. We're purged. Our conscience is purged by the blood. We have access to God through the blood. We're made near to God by the blood. We're cleansed by the blood. We're dressed in clean clothes by the blood. We're overcomers by the blood, and we're washed by the blood. Well, it must have some significance. One of the great Bible teachers of the last century uh, made this statement concerning the blood of Christ. He says, the loftiest estimate which the human mind can form of the blood must fall infinitely short of its divine preciousness. And, and Peter calls it the precious blood of Christ. We have many of our songs that caught this, uh, you know, like there's power in the blood, and what can wash away my sins, nothing but the blood, and are you washed in the blood, or... Uh, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. But most of our modern uh, editions of the scriptures don't understand the significance at all. Most of your modern versions change the word blood and, and in the original it's blood. But most of your modern versions change it to death or sacrifice or some other word, usually one of those two words. As a matter of fact, there's a very popular uh, uh, modern translation, uh, very widely distributed. And someone asked the, uh, the author of that, he's a seminary professor, uh, and they asked him why he changed the word blood to sacrifice or death. He says, well, the word blood has no meaning. And uh, he said, uh, if you had a bucket of blood, what would you have? You know. Well, the poor man just shows that he doesn't understand. You see, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to do an experiment. Look up the word blood in your concordance, wherever it refers to the blood of Christ, and substitute the word death it won't fit. I'll tell you what will fit better. Substitute the word life. To equate blood with death it is to misunderstand what God's saying. The life is in the blood. Now, we don't have time to give an hour Bible study on the significance of the blood of Christ here tonight because that's not our, uh, our lesson. But we will. We'll come to it. Now, there's two ways the Bible says you can be clean. One is by walking in the light. Now, this is cleansing from sins that you don't recognize as sin. Particularly when you're a newer Christian, you don't have light on all that God would call sin. For instance, as, you, uh, as God gives you more and more knowledge about this book, you may come into an understanding that it's sin not to spend an hour a day in this book. It's, it, it may become sin to you to spend more time in the newspaper and, and on the television 
uh, than spending in the Bible. That may become sin to you, but you don't regard it as sin now because that you've not received that light. But God says, if you'll walk in the light that he's given you, if you walk in the light, then as you walk, he will continually cleanse you from all the sin that you don't recognize as sin. Automatically, he keeps you clean. Now, nobody but a Christian has this cleansing. You know, for several years, my wife and I had a ministry of taking teenagers on a tour up through the eastern cities, and then we'd take, take them and spend a week uh, week's vacation at Word of Life Island uh, up in the Adirondack Mountains so that they could uh, hear the gospel and be saved. And we saw literally dozens of teenagers come to Christ, or, or scores of teenagers, and some of them now are on the mission field. I've, I've received letters from two of uh, uh, the very first busload we took up there. Uh, one of them is now a director of Word of Life for the whole nation of Argentina. Some of you met him, Joe Jordan. Leading many kids. He was on that first bus we sent out. Another one was Gary Singleton, who's now a missionary in Spain. And he was on that first bus. And those kids, some of them have gone to all over the world to, uh, to take the gospel. Well, one time we were up there, and the, and the Bible teacher was uh, teaching a, a lesson, and a, a young man came up to him uh, after the lesson, and said to him, say, look, you said the blood of Christ could wash away our sins. He says, that's crazy. He says, that doesn't make a bit of sense in this world. He said, to think that blood that was shed 2,000 years ago could have anything to do with my sin. He says, what foolishness. And this uh, uh, Bible teacher just looked at him, and he said, have you ever sinned? And the boy says, well, you haven't everybody? He said, yes. He says, what will wash away sin? What will wash away sin? And the, and the young man was dumbfounded because he couldn't tell what will wash away sin. And then the Bible teacher says, young man, if the blood of Jesus Christ will not wash away your sins, you will die in your sins. If the blood of Jesus Christ will not cleanse sins, nothing will. And that's all he said. You know, that was on a Thursday night. And the camping ends about Saturday morning. Well, that Saturday morning, that young man got on the telephone and called up his parents and asked him if he couldn't stay another week. He wanted to hear more of that. And he was saved and stayed and worked on staff the rest of the summer. Now, I don't think uh, at the end of the summer he really understood how the blood of Jesus Christ washes away sin. But he knew it did. Because the blood had been applied to his own heart. So the blood of Christ washes away sin, among other things. That's why Peter calls it precious. He says, you're not purchased by corruptible things like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Christ. You see, it says in verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and truth is not in us. If we say we don't ever sin, if there's no sin nature within us. And then in verse 9, if we confess our sins, notice in verse 8 it's sin, in verse 9 it's sins. We commit sins because we have sin in us. That sin is in us and it expresses itself in sins. Well, that sin that is in us is cleansed by the blood of Christ. The sins that flow out from us when we realize that they're sins we confess them and this is for a Christian you see a, a, an unsaved person confesses to God that he is a sinner a saved person confesses to God that he has sinned that he sins if I'm unsaved I say God I'm a sinner just like that old uh a publican did. God be merciful to me, a sinner. God, I'm a sinner. Save me. You see, that's how I get saved. But after I'm saved, I'm not free from sin in this life. Uh, but I, I get cleansed as I confess the sins. I read the Bible. God shows me what the sin is. I say, God, that's sin, and I'm cleansed from the sin. 
this verse 1-9, uh, we used to tell the teenagers, is the Christian's bar of soap. You see, we get dirty as we walk. As we walk through this uh, world, we get dirty with sin. And we need to take a bath very regularly every time we get dirty. Uh, as a matter of fact, don't wait till night. Let's suppose you've got your, your hands all dirty and you look at them and they're filthy dirty. And you look in the mirror and your face is dirty. You don't wait and say, well, now I'm going to wait until I take my bath tonight. Now, I know I'm going to go out on a date in the meantime and I'm going to go to this place and going to eat dinner and all. But uh, I, you don't you don't take your bath till, till you go to bed at night. So I'll just have to stay dirty till then. No. We get out of bar soap and we clean, we clean ourselves when we find out we're dirty, don't we? Well, that's when you confess sin. You don't save them all up until you can get on your knees and then say, all right, God, here I am. I'm ready for my bath. I know I might got, got some dirt on me, so I'm ready for my bath. No, as minute that the Lord brings that to your presence that it's sin, you just say, God, that's sin. I agree with you. Immediately, you're just as white as you can be. Watch. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, we're going to consider verse 10 when we consider chapter 2. So, the Christian privileges, I hope you're appropriating these, uh, these privileges, a certain knowledge and fellowship with God, fullness of joy, walking in the light, and daily, hourly, momentary cleansing by this wonderful bar of soap that he's given us. Every time you feel dirty, you claim this. You say, God, you said, if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. The Christian's bar of soap. We can be clean. We don't have to be dirty in this dirty old world. And nobody but a Christian can enter in to these wonderful privileges in this book. Are you getting yours? Have you appropriated these for yourself? Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you that although I might not understand that the blood of Jesus Christ availed for me and I might not understand all the significance of that uh, precious fluid that was shed at Calvary's cross, I know that you say, that you purchased me with that. And God, that's good enough for me. And you say it's precious. And you say it cleanses. So here I am, God. I need to be clean. And so we thank you, Lord, for these wonderful privileges. And we pray that we'd appropriate them. In Jesus' name, amen.